fellow Canonites, welcome back to another review of Halo Canon, and to the final tribute to a great writer of Halo fiction. Halo Escalation 6 marks the final work of Chris Schlerf within the Halo universe. This man's contributions have, especially in the post-Bungie era, set a high bar for subsequent Halo stories. The raw emotion of the Chief's journey in Halo 4. Cortana, please. Wait. The creation of rich, interesting characters across multiple media. And perhaps his biggest achievement in, my humble opinion, saving Sarah Palmer. For me and others who took issue with Palmer's character in Spartan Ops and Halo Initiation, her development in Halo Escalation was a welcome change. No longer the cocky hypocrite, Palmer felt more like a real person, suddenly having to deal with the consequences of her command decisions and learning some damn humility. We can only hope that future writers learn from this example. Thank you, Mr. Schlurf, for your contributions to Halo. You will be sorely missed, and we wish you the best of luck in all your future endeavors. Alright, let's move on. You're here for a review of Issue 6, not necessarily me singing Schlurf's praises. So let's get right into things. Our issue starts with seeing the sorry state of the Infinity. Having taken three shots from a Covenant glassing beam, the ship is in horrible condition, arguably on the verge of destruction. On board, Hood has been severely injured, and I... I mean severely injured. Commander Bradley is dead, and Infinity herself is dead in the water. Er, vacuum. This scene is beautifully drawn for once, and really draws you into the dire situation that Hood and the Infinity are facing. I don't want to put Hood's full monologue in here, so I'll encourage you to pick it up if you really want to get into what I'm talking about. I want to quickly readdress the issue of the Infinity Shield to the glassing beam. I talked about it briefly last issue when the first shot was fired, but I still saw a number of comments concerning this. So remember, this is a glassing beam, a Covenant ventral beam, which we've only seen used against a ship once in the history of the Halo franchise. At the end of the level Tip of the Spear, the Long Knight of Solace uses her ventral beam to take out the Unicy Grafton, a heavy frigate. Now, based on what we can see, the ventral beam is nowhere near close to its full potential. So really, Issue 5 and technically Issue 6 are the first time we see such a weapon used against a UNSC ship. Now yes, Infinity has shields. And yes, they are based on Forerunner tech. However, they are still energy shields, and they are more vulnerable to plasma weaponry than standard projectile weapons. Given this, it is conceivable that a single shot from a glassing beam could break through the energy shielding pretty easily. Anyway, with Infinity all but beat, Palmer and Majestic take off in their booster frames to neutralize the glassing beam. What really caught my attention about this panel is the fact that the booster frames seem to have Spartan numbers on them. Or, one of them does. When the booster frames were first introduced in Halo Legends, they had the numbers of the Spartan pilots on them. Chief with 0117, Kelly with 0087, etc. Palmer's is seen with the number 0069. Whether this is meaningful or not is yet to be seen, of course. On board the Covenant space station, we find out that the glassing beam is overheated. To keep Infinity from retaliating while the glassing beam recharges, Clayton orders Gajat and his crew to distract them, for a fee, of course. Instead, Gajat decides he'd rather finish Infinity himself, since such an accomplishment would bring untold notoriety and coin. Okay, I think you all know what time it is. Art, Art come, 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 time. Time. I know, I know, not really catchy, but not really the point. In this case, I think we can blame the editor for this little screw-up. Curious as to what I'm referring to? An ill-cropped scene from a disgruntled Clayton. Double-chinned, beard abruptly stopping. Yep, some editor missed a major cropping error. Anyway. With Kajat and Clayton distracted, the Spartans find their opportunity to sneak on board. Acting like real Spartans, they swiftly take over the bridge of the space station. Madsen knocks out Clayton, and the Spartans blow up Kajat's ship. And what a beautiful explosion it is. We jump forward 72 hours as Infinity is undergoing repairs, the Covenant space station is taken control by the UNSC, and Lasky and Ray finally make their way back to their ship. Ray is sent down to Estek for a debriefing, while Palmer apologizes for her behavior prior to Lasky's departure. The two then head out to enjoy a glass of scotch together. I was going to make an Anchorman joke about scotch, but I'm a lot of scotch, so here's some dry gin. Oh, <laughs> it burns! Oh, God! Oh, that really hurts. 
really burns. In another part of the ship, Hood, now in a wheelchair, visits Clayton before the former captain is sent off to Midnight Facility. So, a couple things here to discuss before we finish the summary. To start, we have Hood in a wheelchair. Just briefly, I can't help but wonder if this is going to be a permanent thing, if we might see him this way in future games. Just some quick thoughts that came to mind. Second, and obviously more important, is the mention of Midnight Facility. This Oni facility was first mentioned in the Thursday War, and was where Admiral Peransky sent Dr. Irena Magnuson, after the good doctor allowed Jewel and Dama to escape Oni RF Trevelyan. We still really don't know anything about this facility, other than Magnuson nearly shit herself when Peransky sentenced her there. Clayton seems to think he won't be killed at the facility, and Hood really doesn't seem to be the kind of man that would sentence people to covert deaths. If you're wondering what I'm talking about, many thought that Magnuson was sent to Midnight Facility to be killed. This may actually still be the case, but as the UNSC proper knows of Midnight's existence, I don't really see it as that kind of facility. Perhaps we could think of it as a futuristic Guantanamo Bay. I do hope we find out exactly what it is. This segment of the comic comes to a close with Daniel Clayton informing Hood that the new Colonial Alliance has agents on every colony and, quote, on the poisoned shores of Earth herself. Before they part, he vows that he and Hood would meet when the UNSC finally crumbled, or as he says, when the Empire finally falls. And just to annoy me, the art in this final section is atrocious. I mean, look at this. this. This guy looks like he's having a stroke. The comic comes to a close with us finally seeing the Spirit of Fire. Seemingly just drifting through space, the ship approaches an unknown world in a binary star system. Inside, an alarm is warning to evacuate the ship. Strangely, half the ship's cryopods are open and empty, and in the final panels, we see a flood infection form scurry across the cryobay. A promise of things to come. Hot damn! What an issue! Slurf certainly went out with a bang in more ways than one. You could say he took a page from the Sergeant Johnson playbook. Send me out. In this issue, even though its description was misleading, by which I mean an outright lie, it's still a great read. Palmer's character has certainly undergone a transition in Schlurf's hands, and we can only hope that 343 takes notice of the positive community feedback. Sadly, it seems that we're done for Petra for now, despite what the damn description says, but I think we can expect to see her again in the near future, since the Chief is returning and all. And boy, even though the Spirit of Fire wasn't recovered, it is still around, and I love the idea that it might be carrying the Flood. Many of us lore fans have been predicting the return of the Flood for the Reclaimer Saga, and it looks like we might finally have some solid proof. Only time will tell. And with this, one cannot help but wonder if a Halo Wars 2 might actually be in the works. We have 30 years worth of time between the end of Halo Wars and the Spirit of Fire's appearance in Halo Escalation 6. So, really... Lots of potential for a game. Well, that about wraps up this issue. Once again, a great issue, and I am so glad to see Chris Schlurf leaving on such a high note. The next issue, releasing on June 25th, will start the new Phoenix story arc and really start investigating the fallout from Halo 4's campaign. On an unrelated note, I want to remind everyone about the upcoming q and I'll be taking questions right up through next Friday, so get them in if you haven't already. The final video will go live the morning of June 8th, a day before Microsoft's E3 media briefing. And if all goes according to plan, I'll be providing coverage and commentary regarding the briefing not long after it airs. We know Halo News will be there, and I can't wait to see what will be revealed. Finally, Halo Cannon recently hit 1,000 subscribers, and I cannot thank you all enough. It has been a great journey so far, pun most certainly intended and I can't wait to see how far I can take this channel with your support. Thanks for watching, everyone. This has been Halo Cannon, and I'll see you all again before E3. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and maybe share it around on whatever social media you choose. Also, please be sure to follow me on Facebook and Twitter. All your support is extremely welcome. Thank you all.